Well, children, what, what do you think's in this little bowl? Water. Just water? Holy water. Holy water. Holy water. Any, any, other, any other guesses? Clear juice? Water. Yeah, it's, it's a mixture of the cold water out of the tap, and we all know Auckland water is very average, um, and, and water out of the zip. It's just water. That's all it is. Do you think it's magical? No. You think it's holy? God, well, yeah, everything's holy in that sense, but, well, kind of. Um, but, yeah, it's just water, and yet we put water on babies and adults and anyone else that gets baptized, and yet at the end of the day, it's just water. And do you think, do you think this water is going to, is going to get Blake into heaven? No. Water can't get you into heaven, can it? No. No, no. Do you think maybe Blake trying really, really hard will get him into heaven? No. Believing in God will get him into heaven. That's right. Actually, it's not even our belief that gets us into heaven. It's Jesus that gets us into heaven. You see, all of these things we do are just pictures you see, we, we baptize for many different reasons, but one of the big things is that it's a picture, it's a picture of what we need. And what we need is Jesus to wash us of all of our sins, all of our corruption, everything that's wrong with us because our hearts are bad and then what we do is bad. And we need someone to wash us and make us clean. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus died to wash us and cleanse us from all of our sins and to make us righteous. And so when we baptize someone, we're showing a picture of that. We're showing a picture that there is a God in heaven who promises to wash us clean. And, and for everyone who's baptized, it's a constant picture for us. Every day we can wake up and say, God promises to wash me of my sins. That everyone who comes to him will be forgiven. Isn't that a wonderful picture? That's what we got to celebrate this morning. So let's pray and let's thank God for giving us that picture. Father in heaven, we thank you for these children. We thank you for your promises that you do promise to wash us, that you do promise to clean us, that you do promise to take away our sin if we will but come to you. And so we pray, Lord, would you help each and every one of us, every one of these children to come to you and to be washed clean by your blood, Jesus. We pray for these children. We thank you for them. We thank you for the visiting kids this morning too. And we ask that, Lord, you would work in their hearts, drawing them ever nearer to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're turning through to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. We're not going to be picking up where we were last time. For our visitors, we've been working through 1 and 2 Samuel. But we're going to be skipping ahead, skipping ahead a little bit through to chapter 12. Having the opportunity of a baptism, it's right for us to bend our thoughts towards something related to this. And so we turn through to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we're going to read from verse 15, second half of verse 15, through to 23. But we're actually just going to be considering the second half of verse 23 primarily. So that was 2 Samuel chapter 12, picking up at the beginning of the paragraph in, in verse 15. This is God's holy and infallible word for you this morning. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground, and the elders of his house 
stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. And on the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him. And he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to us and let us come before him in a time of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its richness. We thank you that you have blessed us with a word, with a light, with a lamp to our feet, that, Lord, you have spoken through diverse ways, and yet finally, once and for all, you have spoken through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we have the totality of your word in the Scriptures. And we pray that, Lord, as we turn to it to consider it this morning, that you would bless it to our hearts, that, Lord, as I speak to human ears, Jesus Christ, you would speak to our hearts, our souls, by your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you might be honored, you might be adored, your grace might minister to our souls, and we might know you more richly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our text for this morning is just the end there in verse 23. <clears throat> I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. It might seem like quite a strange passage for you on a baptism while we celebrate life, as we celebrate the incorporation of life into the family of God, that we turn to a passage about death. You might think to yourself, this feels borderline inappropriate for a passage, for an instance such as this. However, sometimes, sometimes it's in the midst of the deepest darkness that the light of God's grace shines the brightest. In fact, it's almost always that way, isn't it? Isn't it at the times of our sufferings and our burdens? And our heart aches that the light of Christ shines the brightest in our lives, that we come to lay hold of the truths of what God says in His Word. It's, it's through trials and difficulties that He presses those things upon us. It's in the veil of tears that the most wonderful flowers are born. And it is no less true for this passage. You see, David shows a confidence in the grace of God that displays a picture for us that is just 
infinitely helpful for us when we come to celebrate something like a baptism, as we come to welcome our children, as we think about our children, as we view our children, as we contemplate all that could happen in our life, as we look at this passage, we see a truth, we see a bold, courageous confidence in the grace of God that we desperately need to have. That we desperately need to lay hold on. And so I want us to consider this morning, where does this confidence that David finds come from? How is it that David can, can look at the death of his son and say, I will go to him? Not, not I might see him again. Not I hope I see him again. Not it'll be lucky if I see him again, but I shall. Go to him. I shall see him again. Where does his hope come from? Well, in order to see that, I want to begin by showing you the doubts that David had every reason to have. You know, David was just a man and he had every reason to doubt that this would be a reality. He had every reason to look at the death of his son and to be overwhelmed with concern and doubt for where his son might be. I mean, just consider David himself, his own sin. This child is a child that has come from sin, right? I mean, he went up on his roof, he looked, he lusted, he pursued, he invited, he welcomed her in her, his home. He committed adultery with her. He gave himself over to sin. He tried to connive his way out of trouble. Having failed to connive his way out of trouble, he murdered Uriah. Can you imagine the guilt when you hear Nathan the prophet say to you, the child will die. You see, the death of this child is a result of the sin of David. He has every reason to doubt, doesn't he? But, but not only his own sin, he has every reason to doubt because of the child's sinfulness. You might think to yourself, what do you mean? The child's only seven days old. Turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, which David wrote reflecting upon this event, upon his actions with Bathsheba and the sin associated with it. Psalm 51, verse 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in all your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, I don't think David is saying, I'm a special case. I was conceived in sin, but no one else is, right? This is true for all human beings. They are conceived in in sin. And so think about the context, right? David's in this situation writing a psalm about his sin, and he says, I was conceived in sin, and who's lying before him? His son, who is conceived in sin. His son, who has not grown up, who has not laid hold of any promises, who has not professed faith. In God. And yet, David, David can say, I shall go to him. He has every reason to doubt. This is a very countercultural statement, isn't it? 
that in the moment that we take up a child and baptize them, we confess that this cute, beautiful, sweet little Blake is an abhorrent sinner worthy of the totality of the wrath of God. I know that doesn't sound nice. I don't like saying it, but that's what the Bible says, right? There is no one good, Romans 3. No, not one. You see, we are not sinful because we sin. We sin because we're sinful. And so David, looking at his own sin, looking at his own life, looking at the way he has caused this to outplay, and looking at this son who is conceived in sin, who by nature, Ephesians 2, is a child of wrath, doesn't he have every reason to think, there's no way that I see this child again. There's no chance. Because this child deserves one thing, the judgment of God. And if we're honest, brothers and sisters, are we any different? Who of us conceived our children in righteousness? Who of us have lived righteously? Who of us can stand up and say, well, look, I know God, but I'm different. I deserve to have my children go to heaven. I've done enough for a mellow puff. Who of us can say that? None of us, right? We are in the exact same situation as David. We have every human reason to doubt salvation, to doubt what happens to our children. And I do not say this lightly. And for some of us, the pain of the loss of a child is ever before us, isn't it? Some of us who have walked through that journey know the pain of that. Where do we find hope for our children? Where do we find hope for the miscarried child? Where do we find hope for the stillborn? Where do we find hope for the child that dies of cancer? Where do we find hope for ourselves and for our offspring. Well, consider where David found his hope. What what was it that enabled David to say with courage and confidence, I will go to him? I mean, just, just compare the way David responds in this situation to his other son's death. you remember his two other sons that die? Remember Amnon? We, We meet him in the next chapter. Amnon's the one who abuses his sister and then gets murdered by his brother Absalom. And then Absalom dies later on. How does David respond to those deaths? When Amnon dies, he tears his clothes and mourns and weeps. When Absalom dies, remember, he's up on the wall. What does he say? Oh, Absalom. Oh, my son, Absalom. And he weeps. Why? Why this difference? Because with those two children, he had no confidence of their salvation because they had shown by their actions to be covenant breakers. But he doesn't do that with this child. He doesn't weep. He stands up. He washes himself. He goes to the tabernacle and he worships his God. And he says, I shall go to the child. Why? Well, firstly, it's not. It's not because of a few things. It's interesting when you, when you Google really quickly whether children go to heaven, you get a whole array of different answers, as you are not surprised by, I'm sure. And so some of the different answers you get are, well, children are innocent. If you've had a child for at least two years, you know this is not the case. But the Bible tells us that's abundantly not the case. Or maybe it's the idea of the age of accountability that until they can understand, some base this on Romans 1, that until they can understand, 
they're, they're not held accountable, but the problem is they have sin. And they have sin that has to be dealt with. You can't just make sin disappear. Or could it be like the Catholics believe that there's a place called limbo where children go and their sins are dealt with there through the church and the saints? Or could it be, as some suggest, that at the end of days, these children will be raised and given another chance to believe? Well, you don't find that in the Bible either. Or could it be, as, as one elder, not in this church, I should clarify that, as one elder said to me, oh, no, 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 Logan, all of the children go up to heaven and become angels. I'm not sure where that came from, but that's another option. It's none of these, is it? Because none of that finds any hope or assurance in the scripture. None of it provides you with, with, with a rock to stand on. And the promises of God always give you a rock. They're a firm foundation. So what does David know? What does David look to? Where could David's hope come from? Well, firstly, it's the character of God himself. The character of God himself. Exodus 34 Exodus 34, when he appears before Moses, the Lord, verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, or you'll see in the footnote, to the thousandth generation as it was originally translated, and in my opinion, still should be. He, he extends his mercy and grace and love and faithfulness to us and to our children. And so David is able to lay hold of the very character of who God is and say, this is the type of God that we have. He functions in this way, in grace and mercy. But, but David also knows that this grace and mercy is not just applied generically, is it? He doesn't just chuck grace and mercy out in places. But he knows that God is a God who makes covenants with his people. And so we think of those wonderful covenants made to Abraham, which David would have known back to front. And so God says to Abraham in 17 of Genesis, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To do what? To be God to you and to your offspring. And so David was able to lay hold of not just the character of God, but the way that God covenants himself. You say, what's a covenant? Think marriage. Marriage is a covenant. God marries himself to his people. He marries himself to Abraham and says, I will be your God. And I will be your children's God. And you and them will be my people. He lovingly welcomes David as a child to come. And David knows that that means he welcomes his children. He welcomes his children. But not only that, David himself, he knows the forgiveness for himself. Have a look at the text in verse 13. Chapter 12, verse 13 David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. David knew intimately the reality of salvation, didn't he? David knew that there's a God in heaven who washes away sin, who blots out our sin. 
who welcomes us with grace and mercy and forgiveness, and He welcomes us with our families, with our children, through the covenant to receive salvation. But, but David also knew that there's a, there's a God who not only forgives, but also adopts. He adopts our children. And, and so in 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, God will say of David's son Solomon, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and also, turn with me to Ezekiel. There's a, a, a stunning passage. It's, it's unique in the way it comes out. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, verse 20 to 21. You took... now. Just, just notice the, the pronoun usage. If you don't know what a pronoun is, it's the you's, the yours, the me's, the I's, those types of things. Okay? You took your sons and your daughters, whom you had born to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured, them being false gods. Were your whorings... So small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them. Did you hear what Paul, did you hear what Ezekiel says? Did you hear what God says through Ezekiel? That was it such a small thing that you slaughtered my children? You see, God looks at the children of his people and he doesn't say, Oh, yeah, I love your kids too. He says, I love my children. And, and so we can say to our children, and, and I've said this to my children frequently, at the end of the day, you're actually not my child. You are God's child. And I have you on loan. God's charged me as like a steward to raise you up for him. That's my job. But you're not my child at the end of the day. You are the Lord's child. This was what was such an abomination about sacrificing children to idols in the Old Testament. It was because they were taking God's children and sacrificing them to Baal and Molech and any other number of gods. You see, David knew that when God looked at his little unnamed son, that, that God said, mine, mine. And that when God looks at Blake, he says, mine. But maybe you're thinking to yourself, that's just Old Testament stuff. Because after all, you know, God worked in one way in the Old Testament, and then at the coming of Jesus, everything changed. Everything got a bit different. We entered into the new covenant. Maybe you've heard that before. People will say, no, no, old covenant, new covenant, they're very separate. They're completely different, and there's no connection between the two. Except when we get to the New Testament, we find the exact same language being used. And so... God can say of our children, they are holy. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14. Sounds a whole lot like my children, right? In the New Testament, we can find Jesus in Mark 10 welcoming the children and saying, to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. They are heirs of the kingdom, Jesus says. Jesus takes the children and associates himself with them and says effectively, we're part of the kingdom, disciples. I'm not sure what you guys are on about. 
Here are the children that God has given me. But then also, the, the same promises that are given in the Old Testament are forwarded through to the New Testament, aren't they? What comes out in Acts 2? The people cry out, what must I do to be saved? And Peter says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. This promise is for you and your children. You see, it's the exact same language over and over again. But, but on top of that, we actually see the unborn as part of God's family. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but if, if you go to Luke 1, in Luke 1, you see something quite striking. Luke 1 verse 14. This is to Zechariah. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Look, wait a second. He's filled with the Holy Spirit from, his, from the mother's womb? That means he's a child of God, right? That means he's part of God's family, right? From within the womb. And then in verse 44, it says, verse 43, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Verse 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my loom, womb leapt for joy. So John, in the womb, perceives the mother of his Lord, of his Messiah, of his Savior, of his Christ, and he bounces for joy. Do you see the picture here? It's the picture of a child who is yet to be old enough to mentally comprehend what one plus one is, and yet is a child of God, walking in fullness of the Spirit. But not only that, in the New Testament, what's striking is that you never, ever, ever, ever find a command or an invitation for children to repent and believe. But what you do find is a bunch of commands for them to obey. Have you ever thought about that? Ephesians 6, children, Paul says, children, obey your parents. Colossians 3, children, obey your parents. In the qualifications of elder under Titus, one of the requirements is that the elders' children be faithful. You can translate it as believing or faithful. I think faithful is the better translation. That their children walk in faithfulness. You see, the expectation of the New Testament is that our children are going to walk in the way of the faith. It would be legalism, wouldn't it? It would be legalism to tell our children to follow the commandments if they're unbelievers. But they're not. They are part of the household of God and they're treated that way and they're welcomed and embraced in that way. You see, ultimately, David and we can have confidence in the eternal destiny of our children. Day in and day out, from within the womb to without the womb, because there is a God of all grace and mercy who covenants himself to us, who makes promises to us and our children, who extends grace and mercy to both us and our children, and none of it relies upon us. And none of it relies upon water. But all of it, relies upon Christ. You know what's really striking about 2 Samuel 12? Did you notice what day he died on? 
the seventh day. What happens on the eighth day? Circumcision. See, this child's not even circumcised. And yet David can look at the grace of God even before the child has received the sacrament and say, this child is with God. This child is in heaven. And one day, one day I will see him face to face. This is our hope, brothers and sisters. And we're running out of time, but let me just provide you with seven very brief, and I do mean brief, seven very brief implications that come out from this. Firstly, if, if you, like me, have lost a child before, you can have bold confidence that one day you will see that child face to face. That one day you will see that child as they were meant to be. You can have confidence that it is far better for them than for you because their pain and sorrow was ended while yours still lingers on. Secondly, you can embrace children the way God does. You can look at your children and say, my children, God says of you. Do you know how wonderful that is? You can look at your children and firmly believe that God says, these are my children. You don't need to treat them like unbelievers. You don't need to try and call them to repentance every day, to call them to salvation. You can look at them and say, God says, my children. You can also expect God's help with your children, can't you? Number three. Because if they're God's children, God's more passionately interested in your children than you are. You get annoyed at your children. So do I. But God never does. We get tired, but God doesn't. We sleep, he never slumbers. Number four, you can apply the means of grace to your children. You can baptize your children with confidence. Why? Because they're God's children. And he has said the baptism is the sign that these children are my children, that they're part of my family. Fifthly, we can hold up expectations before our children. You see, if your child is an unbeliever, whatever you do, do not teach them the Lord's Prayer. It's inappropriate for them to pray it because they're not disciples. If your children are unbelievers, do not train them in the way they should go. Call them to repentance. But if your children are a part of the household of God, you can say to them, this is how your father expects you to live. That father. Because you're a child of God. This is how children of God live. They walk in righteousness. They honor their parents. And you can hold that up before your children. You just say, the reason you have to listen to me, Johnny, is not because I'm bigger than you. Because we know that runs out eventually. No, you have to listen to me because God is your father and God says you have to listen to me. Sixthly, you can assume your children are saved. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do, to assume your children are saved in the same way the Jews could. You see, the Jews never looked at their children and, and thought to themselves, oh, I wonder if they're saved. No, no, they just, they, they just assumed they were, unless they showed by their sinful behavior they're not part of the family of God, right? And that's how we can view our children. We assume they are part of the household of faith, part of the family of God, inheriting the kingdom of God, inheriting salvation, unless they show themselves to be covenant breakers. And then lastly, 
we can call our children to lay hold of all of the promises. Remember what, they, what, what I asked James and Josie? I said to them, will you, will you seek to remind this child and call this child and hold before this child the reality that he needs to lay hold of all of the promises that were made? And you can do that with your children. You can say, there is a God who says, I will save any who draw near to me. It's a glorious thing to have confidence in the grace of God, isn't it? David had it. Do you have it? Do you have it for yourself? I mean, it's, it's one thing for us to sit here and talk about our children, right? What about you? Do you have confidence? Can you say, if I die, I will go to heaven? If I die, I will go to God? You see, if you can't say that, the whole discussion of children is a waste of time, if you get what I mean. Because there's a far more important issue, and that is your eternal destiny. And God himself says that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to come to God and receive it. Not tomorrow. But to lay hold of that same grace and say, God is my God. And he washes me clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we pray. Wash us clean. We thank you for the grace that David hoped in. And we pray that you would help us to hope in it too. Help us to put our resting place in the grace of the living God. In whose name we pray. Amen.